Kelly Dansu Grasso, Adult Services Program Coordinator. And, and I'm Erin Brooker Lozad. I'm the Director of Clinical Services here at the Ailes for Autism Foundation. And today we're going to present on promoting social emotional learning in young adults with autism spectrum disorder. This webinar will highlight the value of social emotional learning and the inherent challenges individuals with autism have with social emotional learning. After watching this webinar, you should be able to gain a greater understanding of the social and communication challenges individuals with ASD have and tools you can use to apply evidence-based strategies that will promote social emotional learning. The webinar is geared towards peers, family members, and communication partners that would like to learn practical tools to teach social emotional learning in everyday conversation and social interactions with young adults with ASD. So first, let's define what is social emotional learning. Just a second, here we are. According to CASEL, Collaborative for Social Emotional Learning, social emotional learning is the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Difficulties in these areas may result in the inability to form relationships, isolation, anxiety, depression, and difficulties functioning in everyday society. So social emotional learning really became popular in the 90s when there was a shift in the education system to focus on the whole child. It was around this time that more research and literature was being created on the value of emotional intelligence. Social emotional learning started being adapted into school-wide curriculum in various communities. And although social emotional learning is taught a lot in schools, um, this we understand the value of it not only for school-age children, but also for adults. Social emotional learning is necessary for transition into adulthood, learning daily living skills, working towards independence, and securing and maintaining employment. So social emotional programming is based on the understanding that the best learning emerges in the context of supportive relationships that make learning challenging, engaging, and meaningful. Therefore, as a peer, a family member, or communication partner, there's great opportunity to work on social emotional learning. So CASEL, again, Collaborative for Social Emotional Learning, has broken down social emotional learning into five competencies. The first one is self-awareness, and then self-management and emotional regulation, social awareness, relationship and social skills, and responsible decision-making. Later on in this webinar, we'll take a closer look at each competency and give examples of these competencies in action. Social emotional learning is critical, yet often challenging for individuals with ASD due to the deficits in social communication and interaction. Now, we will review the defining features of autism spectrum disorder and specifically highlight the deficits in social communication and interaction. So Erin will discuss this further. Thanks, Emily. So when we're looking at social emotional um, learning and we're looking at autism, in autism, we want to look at the main areas that are affected. All individuals with ASD or autism spectrum disorder have difficulties in two major categories, social communication and interaction and restricted and repetitive behaviors. However, individuals will vary in how many specific symptoms they exhibit and how severe those symptoms are. All individuals with ASD have some difficulty with communication, yet language abilities we will see will vary widely across the spectrum. For the purpose of this webinar, we're really going to focus on the difficulties in social communication and interaction as it directly relates to the topic of social emotional learning. 
So to define features in ASD, we look to the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5th edition now um, that we've been using for the past couple of years, the DSM-5. And we look at individuals with autism spectrum disorder having difficulties in social initiations and responses, having oftentimes you'll see abnormal social approaches to social interactions, so how somebody comes up to you to initiate an interaction or not. Possibly um, this individual or person with autism may have issue with coming up and being face to face versus maybe they'd walk up from the back and back into you. Possibly they get too close and they don't have personal space, um, boundaries or understanding or awareness of that. Abnormal conversational skills. So possibly I only, if I have autism, want to talk about the topic if I'm verbal of my interest and I, or I, I don't. I don't necessarily add to a conversation of your interest because I don't have interest in doing that or have the knowledge or the skill sets to do that. Um, maybe I don't know how to have back and forth conversations. Reduced sharing of interests, reduced sharing of emotions and affect. And I think that this is an important one to focus on because it's not as though people with autism don't have emotions and aren't affectionate. It's the ability to be able to share emotions and affect in a conventional manner using language, understanding the words to use for emotional expression, when to um, express emotion, to what level do I express emotion, and how does this emotion and my expression of it or sharing of it match the um, situation. So if I'm getting married, let's say, I should be extremely excited and I should have lots of emotions that I share, but if that same level of emotion is shared um, in something that possibly somebody may just say that was great, then you don't have those scales of justice of the understanding of how excited or how sad um, each situation, I guess, would, I guess not each situation would, would uh, be, a, it would be appropriate for, but how to co correspond your emotional, uh, sharing of emotions and affect to each situation would be something that is difficult. And then the reduction in doing so, because maybe if I don't have the skills, I'm not necessarily going to just put myself out there to do it. Um, lack of initiation of social interactions and poor social initiation. So if I have social communication as a primary deficit, I'm not necessarily going to be the person that's always going to initiate because I don't know how to then navigate my social environment once I have that initiation. It's almost like I can't control what's going to happen next, so I'd rather not do this. Not because a person with autism doesn't want to be social or want to be around people. Oftentimes, especially with those individuals with verbal skills, with higher cognitive skills or adaptive skills. They have desires to be social, but they don't necessarily have the sophistication of the social skills to do it successfully. And so then you'll see this decrease in those initiations. So all of these characteristics may impair fostering appropriate social relationships and lead to greater challenges in acquiring and excelling in social emotional competencies. Um, in looking at specifically social interaction and communication challenges. Again, we see little sharing of pleasure, interests, and achievements with others. Like I just mentioned, difficulty with back and forth conversation. So maybe I can have a great one-way conversation, but that reciprocity or that volley between two people may not necessarily be something that I'm gonna do if I have autism or until I'm taught. Limited or lack of eye contact, and, and this is important because it's not so much that a person with autism can't make eye contact, it's that it's difficult to use eye contact for social communication pur purposes or to pay attention to the things that are going to help me navigate my social world or to shift my eye contact back and forth, forth between a person and action and what the item that they're you know, kind of using within that action and between two people to make sure I truly have the understanding of all the nonverbal information like facial expressions and the words and how that comes together. Most of our message that we send when we're communicating is with our eyes. And if I'm not really paying attention to that part of the face, I'm going to miss a lot of the meaning behind the words that are used in a conversation or let's say in an instruction given in some sort of classroom or even a work environment. Um, so difficulty using and combining nonverbal behaviors. Again, if I haven't paid attention to coordinated communication, gestures and eye contact together or these facial expressions with the words, I may say something without necessarily combining the nonverbal behaviors that would then enhance my message and make myself better understood. Um, and I may not understand them when someone says, let's say, something sarcastic, oh yeah, that's great. 
and their face shows that it's not great. If I haven't paid attention to that, I could misunderstand that and think that it's perfectly fine when in actuality it was sarcasm that I didn't pick up on. So any of that figurative language is probably going to be hard because it's not just the words, it's understanding and using words combined with that nonverbal communication that really makes or breaks somebody's uh, ability to get their message across. And then uh, may repeat what others say. And, and in autism, we call this echolalia. So there's immediate echolalia where you repeat what the person says immediately after they say it in the same intonation and prosody that that person says it. So if I say, it's so great, then the person would immediately say, it's so great, just as though it was an echo from me. Delayed echolalia is something that's a little bit more tricky to, to understand and to see because it may be that a person has heard something in a different conversation at a different time and they've almost taken a chunk of information from what they've heard regardless of their understanding of that language or that information and then they place it perfectly such as you place a puzzle piece into a puzzle at a later time where it may often give the illusion that they understand more because they're able to use this very specific language that seems like it's unique or generative to themselves when in actuality it was borrowed from something else. Um, Sometimes it can be very conventional. So uh, a good example of someone saying, I'm sorry, right? They've heard I'm sorry before. And so if they can match a situation where something doesn't go well and someone says, you need to say I'm sorry, and then they know that I'm sorry is the answer, but they don't really, it's not their words. They're just taking a piece of information and placing it perfectly. You may think that they know that they did something wrong. They apologize so they should know better. Another unconventional example is, let's say, a young man with autism that was very hungry happened to be watching a Kit Kat commercial during the time in which lunch was going to be served. And so when he was hungry, every time after that, he said, what do I want? What do I want? A Kit Kat bar, a Kit Kat bar. You wouldn't possibly know that that meant that he was hungry, but that's what he associated requesting to eat with. And that was the language he borrowed and then used. So echolalia is something that the person knows I'm supposed to say something after you say it or I'm supposed to put this language in but I don't necessarily have my own language to use so I either immediately use yours or I use borrowed language from another situation later on and and this is something that's not bad we can teach with it because we know that now someone knows there needs to be two people in this conversation or I need to add information I just need more teaching of being able to generate my own thoughts. Um, when we have, um, when we have, sorry about that, when we have peer relationship challenges, individuals with ASD have difficulty with peer relationships. They often have trouble sharing, taking turns, working in collaborative groups, and sometimes it appears as if the individual is oblivious to others or uninterested in those around them. But most often, an individual with ASD may have trouble making and keeping friendships, again, because of those social interaction or social communication deficits or difficulties that they have, not because they don't necessarily have a desire. Okay, so I think that's really important. How do we teach somebody how to be, how to navigate their social world? And as we go through this webinar, hopefully, we'll be able to find out more about how to, to ensure that the social emotional learning is uh, very well I guess instilled in someone's skill sets. So individuals with ASD don't want to don't want to be social. It is a part of their disability. This statement is absolutely false. Individuals with ASD may have social challenges. However, individuals with ASD want to engage with others, develop friendships, and participate in even romantic relationships similar to those individuals without autism or what we often call neurotypical peers. If you speak to someone with autism, they may not necessarily say that neurotypical is a compliment, but um, for the purpose of this webinar, we'll use the term neurotypical to represent those individuals without autism. Educators, mentors, and support staff must be um, explicit, must work to explicitly teach social skills and not to assume that individuals will voluntarily know how to engage. And so um, we are going to um, make sure that uh, individuals with ASD and other developmental disabilities remember that they desire the same social connection, intimacy, and relationships, and, and really that they just may need certain accommodations or an individual may need certain supports and more explicit teaching of skills to learn, not that they don't want to and not that they can't learn.
So Emily is going to um, pick up from here and really move into how do we foster social emotional learning in individuals with ASD. Thanks, Erin. So now let's discuss how we can foster social emotional learning, as Erin just stated. So first, the thing that's really important is to understand the nature of ASD and to take into account the impact of their neurological differences in terms of learning these social emotional learning skills. Second is to use evidence-based strategies to teach social emotional learning. And third, to always keep an open mind and never assume that the individual understands your social cues or innuendos and nonverbal communication. And lastly, um, after this webinar, you know, we really hope that you can take away some simple and effective tools to increase social emotional lear learning um, in those that you may support. So looking at each competency, the first competency is self-awareness. According to Castle, self-awareness is the ability to accurately recognize one's own emotions, thoughts, and values, and how they influence behavior. The ability to accurately assess one's strengths and limitations with a well-grounded sense of confidence, optimism, and growth mindset. I know in an employment setting um, in which I used to work in a hospital, I worked with one young man who had autism spectrum disorder who had a very hard time identifying his emotions, other than feeling down or upset with himself. He always would fixate on his weaknesses and negative past experiences with employment that he had a hard time perceiving that he could feel differently about himself or recognize when he did something positive at work. And I would always try to bring to his attention these positive experiences that he was having and help him to identify the words or feelings he was having in that moment. However, oftentimes he'd kind of have that fixed mindset where even with these small victories, he would just start to fixate on the fact that he might mess up again and he would repeat, I know I can't change, I know I can't change. And you kind of get consumed in that thought and then just stop working. So he really had a hard time seeing the relationship of his new behavior or his work and to his emotions and feelings. Um, and so understanding the limitations an individual with ASD may have with self-awareness or having a greater sense of their emotional state in the moment um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's not good to kind of assume that they may have the language to describe their emotions, or even when you ask simply, how are you, or how are you feeling, that they'll be able to respond to that question. I find that it sometimes is helpful instead to give a person choices. And you can also, in order to do that, use a visual support. And we'll show an example on the next slide um, that can really help somebody to identify their emotions and feelings. So visual supports are concrete cues that provide information about an activity, routine, or expectation, and or support skill demonstration. Visual supports can also provide clear, accessible choices for an individual who may have a hard time internally understanding and then articulating how they are feeling or what they're trying to say or request from someone else. You could also help the individual you're working with develop self-awareness by giving them concrete feedback about your observation of them and their emotion attached to that observation. For example, you might say, wow, I can see that you're tensing your jaw and your eyebrows are scrunched. You must be feeling angry. Of course, if an individual is angry, he may not want to overstimulate them with words, so it might be helpful just to bring their attention to the visual support. But in the instance of if they're really excited and they have a big smile on their face and red cheeks, you might say, wow, you look really excited. I can see with your big smile that you're feeling happy. So the second competency is self-management. Castle states that self-management is the ability to successfully regulate one's emotions, thoughts, behaviors in different situations effectively, manage stress, control impulses, and motivate oneself the ability to set and work towards personal and academic goals. Self-management skills help to effectively manage stress, control impulse, and motivate oneself. Um, and self-management, once again, can be really challenging for an individual with ASD. I know in um, an employment setting, once again, in which I worked, I worked with a young lady who had a diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism, and um, she was interning in a childcare setting, and she had some diet restrictions but she couldn't really 
control her impulse to want to eat food. And at one point, she got in trouble for eating another staff member's lunch. And I just remember her being really upset with herself and uh, herself and really overcome by emotion. But she couldn't understand when she received consequences being sent home from work, why she was being sent home. She couldn't make that connection to her actions. So I used a graphic organizer, which I'll share on the next page, that helped her to clearly see the relationship of her action to the consequences. And a graphic organizer is a great tool that you can help, um, you can use to help an individual to organize their thoughts or to identify the relationship between a situation and the consequences. Also, it's important to note appropriate emotional expression may be challenging for individuals with ASD. Most individuals with autism often don't perceive others as a source of help or social engagement or emotional assistance. An individual with autism may often feel vulnerable and stressed when engaged in social interaction. As a peer, family member, or communication partner, I think it's always important to, important to verbally reassure the individual of your role as a helper or a support. So here's an example of the graphic organizer that I've used. And these come in many formats um, by simply, you know, going on Google and looking up a graphic organizer, you can find some templates. Um, a graphic organizer is also known as a knowledge map, story map, or a cognitive organizer. And as I mentioned, I created this, or this graphic organizer when working with the individual in the childcare setting, and it was really helpful after the fact for her to see the relationship of her choices and the, and the consequences um, for her actions. Competency, com competency three, social awareness. Social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of and emphasize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds and cultures. The ability to understand social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school, and community resources and supports. Perspective taking is an area of weakness for an individual with ASD. Perspective taking is necessary for individuals in all areas of their life, especially in the workplace and the community setting, where it is important to follow social norms and where one develops relationships. Um, I, you know, going back to just my personal experience, I know uh, at Ells for Autism, where we do a lot of support employment, we were working with an individual that had a challenging time taking the perspective of the others. And in this case, it was the customers. He was in a customer service role um, as a game room attendant. And every time um, a customer would come up and say, hey, can you give me that toy truck or can I get those um, bouncy balls? He would, he would correct them and say, that's not my name, it's not you, and he would tell them his name. So one thing that we did for him to really take on um, that level of social awareness and to perspective taking of the customer was created a social narrative that he could use that could help him think through the social situation as it occurred. So in that moment, he could use the refer to a story and see what he's thinking and what he should be saying. A social narrative or story-based intervention is a great tool to use to help an individual with ASD develop social awareness. Here's an example that I found. Um, and social narratives are interventions that describe the social situation in some detail by highlighting the relevant cues and offering examples of appropriate response. They can help learners adjust to changes in a routine and adapt their behaviors based on the social and physical cues of the situation or teach a specific social skill or behavior. Social narratives are nice because they can be really individualized to the learner's needs and typically are quite short. Um, they can um, you know, even be picture-based and used as a visual aid. They're usually written in first person um, from the perspective of the learner. Social narratives include sentences that detail the situation, provide suggestions for appropriate learner response, and describe the thoughts and feelings other people have that are involved in the situation. If you were to create a social narrative, you would describe the given situation, provide visual representation, provide concrete and accurate information, subtract social interference, identify relevant social cues, describe expected behavior, and describe the perspective of the other. 
So moving on to competency four, relationship skills. As Castle highlights, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups, the ability to communicate early or clearly, listen well, cooperate with others, resist inappropriate social pressure, negotiate conflict constructively, and seek and offer help when needed. And as we stated earlier in this presentation, individuals with ASD have the same desires for social connection and relationship as their neurotypical peers. However, due to the inherent deficits in social communication and interaction, it is often extremely challenging for an individual to know the proper way to engage with their peers and build relationships. So social skills must be explicitly taught. A tool to teach social skills is through role playing. Role playing is a chance to practice social behaviors in a safe environment where an individual may feel less anxious. The, one, the more one is able to practice their social skills, the more confident they will feel in handling certain um, social situations as they arise. Once again, just kind of referring uh, back to my own experience, I worked with one individual with ASD, um, and I'm still working with him, who is a custodian at a local elementary school, and he was having trouble taking feedback from a supervisor. When a supervisor would give him any feedback about his work, he would come across as ignoring him or upset and non-responsive to his feedback. This young man, who is slow at processing information and also lacks the skills to engage with others appropriately at times, needed to practice his social skills to receive that feedback. So in my role as a job coach, we were able to role play the supervisor and um, custodian interaction. And at first he would do the same thing and walk away and from me at playing the role as a supervisor, but then I would teach him the proper response um, of how to acknowledge his supervisor and then provided him with a script as to how to respond to his supervisor's feedback. And after role playing this several times, the supervisor saw a significant change in how the individual received feedback. So role playing really gives you, the partner role playing, the chance to provide the feedback to the individual. You could even record yourself and the individual role playing a specific situation so the individual could then watch themselves and observe their own responses and behavior. And as a peer, family member, or communication partner, there are so many social situations you could role play with the individual you support. It could be work related, like preparing for a job interview. That's something I do a lot with the students I've worked with. Um, you know, there's so many interview questions online and you could act as the employer and practice the whole scenario. Um, also, if maybe the individual that you're friends with or support um, or a parent to, maybe not a parent, maybe more it would be appropriate for a sibling, but if they were, had some personal um, social skills desires like asking a significant other out, they can role play that with you too. It would be a great way to really help the individual to work on their relationship skills. Um, in a safe and trusted established relationship. So the last social emotional competency is responsible decision making. Castle states responsible decision making is the ability to make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on ethical standards, safety concerns, and social norms. The realistic evaluation of consequences of various actions in consideration of the well-being of oneself and others. And as we all know, decision-making is something that we have to do every day in all aspects of our lives. And it can be really challenging for all of us. However, it can be exceptionally challenging and hard for individuals with ASD. Um, you know, directly quoting from a research study that uh, Living Autism Foundation published, a research study that uh, was in the journal Autism, they looked at, they said that where 38 adults with ASD and 40 neurotypical um, comparison adults aged 16 to 65 years completed a novel questionnaire to evaluate their decision-making experiences, the questionnaire asked participants to rate the frequency with which particular problems in decision-making were experienced, the extent to which they perceive difficulties in relation to particular features of decision, and finally, the extent to which participants with ASD believe that their condition enhanced or interfered with their own decision making. Um, lastly, they also looked at the levels of anxiety and depression that, um, that occurred 
by using the uh, well-established established hospital anxiety and depression scale. And as the article stated, the results indicated that compared with their neurotypical peers, the participants with ASD more frequently reported difficulties in decision making, decisions that needed to be made quickly or involved a change of routine or talking to others were experienced as particularly difficult, and the process of decision making was reported to be exhausting, overwhelming, and anxiety provoking. The participants with ASD reported significantly higher levels of anxiety and depression and were more likely to believe that their condition interfered with rather than enhanced the decision making process. Not surprisingly, the participants with ASD were also more likely to report that they avoided decision making. So as we talked about, this is hard for all of us, but understanding how it could be even more stressful for an individual with ASD, a great tool to use to really help break down the decision-making process um, is a uh, social autopsy. And a social autopsy is really just a way to examine the social situation. So once again, there are great resources online, um, and there's other webinars and tools on our website. But a social autopsy is a way to really examine and dissect the social scenario or even a social area error that may have made, and then determine the next steps to prevent such an error from occurring again. You may want to use a social autopsy with an individual when they share with you about a challenge they had at home or work. You can use this tool to help them to identify the best choices to make moving forward. For example, if he or she may tell you that they've got their electronics taken away for yelling at their parent or for not, um, you know, going to a social event they wanted to attend, you could use a social autopsy to examine the situation more closely and empower them to make better decisions in the future. So I just want to highlight some other social emotional um, skills that you can work on in everyday interactions. The first one being concentrating and staying on topic. As Erin uh, discussed early, earlier in identifying the communication challenges of individuals with ASD. Um, as we talked about, an individual may be selective and want to talk about their preferred subject of interest. And I believe as a communication partner, you can kindly but firmly state, can you please answer my question or um, we are going to talk about work right now, and we can talk about your favorite movies in the last five minutes of our time together. I oftentimes will use a timer to set parameters around when we can talk about certain topics and as a means to help us stay on topic. You, um, another thing that might happen, like we were saying, in terms of wanting to maybe dominate the conversation or talk about their subject of interest, is if you ask an individual a question, but they don't seem to want to answer you, if this occurs, it might be a good idea to, of course, write the question down or try to ask the question in another way. Um, for example, there's a student I work with that has a hard time when I say, what are you doing this weekend? They don't really respond. But if I uh, rephrase the question and make it more of a statement, Hannah is doing what this weekend, um, she has an easier time responding. I, I find that, and I think this is common, that a lot of times when you um, say, how are you, you know, pronouns are sometimes confusing um, for some individuals with ASD. So oftentimes I will um, refer to them by their name. And as we talked about, eye contact can make an individual with ASD uncomfortable at times. Um, and so if I'm in a conversation with an individual that might be looking away from me, I might uh, kindly give them a reminder, can you look at me when I'm talking to you and try to bring their attention to my eyes. Another technique that I've taught individuals to use, especially if they were to go in for a job interview where, you know, it's an expected norm to make eye contact with the employer is to set up a system of kind of tapping their leg as a reminder to kind of look up every once and again to the employer. So it's not, you know, it might not be realistic to keep your eyes on someone the whole time, but just being able to give yourself that quick reminder to look up every once and again. And um, 
lastly, you might find when you're having a conversation, it feels like, and we kind of talked about it, that the conversation feels very one-sided. And I will just acknowledge this for the, the individual. I might say, I feel like you aren't asking me any questions. Would you like to know what I'm doing this weekend? Or um, would you like to know what my favorite movie is? And when I've done this with individuals, it seems to work as a prompt for them. And then they may repeat back the question and ask me the question. So in summary, as a peer, family member, or communication partner, you have the unique opportunity to really work on an individual's social emotional learning skills, which are critical to all aspects of their lives. Social emotional learning is taught through relationships. So you should never, and once again, never assume that an individual with ASD just knows what to do or has the social and personal awareness necessary to engage in the relationship. Across the spectrum, social communication and interaction are challenging for individuals with ASD to various degrees. And those that seem to have greater social abilities most likely have received greater intervention and social skills training in the course of their life. Social skills must be explicitly taught. Social emotional learning is empowering to individuals and helps them to form and maintain relationships that bring on a greater sense of confidence and overall sense of well-being. I hope this webinar has provided you with some practical tools that you can use to help facilitate growth in the five social emotional learning competencies. And like I said, we really just kind of highlighted some of the very easy tools that are accessible um, online, different templates to use in kind of everyday interactions. And I just want to leave you with this quote um, that I really like that Brene Brown, research professor and author that researches a lot on connection and vulnerability, captures the fullness of connection when she shares her definition. I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from relationship. And as we said, although individuals with ASD may struggle with communication or have challenges with social engagement in our often one-fits-all model of society, we as humans are all striving and deserve human connection. May we, through our relationships with the other, help each other to experience deep, meaningful, and fulfilling connection. So once again, we appreciate um, our one participant that's on the line and for those that uh, view this webinar. And we just want to open up the floor for any questions that you might have. If, um, if you have questions, you can feel free to write them in the chat box. We'll give it another minute and just see, and otherwise we'll sign off, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thanks. And we hope you enjoyed it. Let us know if you need anything in the future. All right, bye, everybody.